Hello, welcome to St Andrews. Last week we started a new uh, series on the book of 1 Samuel and we'll be covering quite large sections, uh, some weeks three to four chapters at a time. So I'd really encourage you to read through the book of 1 Samuel as we work through it. Read the in-between bits, you'll get so much more out of it if you do. Today we're seeing how the Israelites were simultaneously rebelling against God and trying to control him and it won't surprise you to learn that that didn't go well. It was only when the Israelites humbled themselves and were obedient that their situation began to change. Our theme today is God is in control and our key verse is 1 Samuel 4 verse 3. When the soldiers returned to camp the elders of Israel asked why did the Lord bring defeat on us today before the Philistines? Let us bring the ark of the Lord's covenant from Shiloh so that he may go with us and save us from the hand of our enemies. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we recognise that you are in control, that we need to submit our lives to you. We pray that we won't be looking for what we can get out of our relationship with you, but rather looking to see how you want to change us, what you want to do in us and through us, what you're asking of us. Father, we pray that we will humble ourselves and live in faithful obedience. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now the Israelites went out to fight against the Philistines. The Israelites camped at Ebenezer and the Philistines at Aphek. The Philistines deployed their forces to meet Israel and as the battle spread, Israel was defeated by the Philistines who killed about 4,000 of them on the battlefield. When the soldiers returned to camp, the elders of Israel asked, why did the Lord bring defeat on us today before the Philistines? Let us bring the Ark of the Lord's Covenant from Shiloh so that he may go with us and save us from the hand of our enemies. So the people sent men to Shiloh and they brought back the Ark of the Covenant of the Almighty Lord Almighty who is enthroned between the cherubim. And Eli's two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, were there with the Ark of the Covenant of God. When the Ark of the Lord's Covenant came into the camp, all Israel raised such a great shout that the ground shook. Hearing the uproar, the Philistines asked, what's all this shouting in the Hebrew camp? When they learned that the Ark of the Lord had come into the camp, the Philistines were afraid. A God has come into the camp, they said, Oh no, nothing like this has happened before. We're doomed. Who will deliver us from the hand of these mighty gods? They are the gods who struck the Egyptians with all kinds of plagues in the wilderness. Be strong, Philistines. Be men, or you will be subject to the Hebrew, Hebrews as they have been to you. Be men and fight. So the Philistines fought and the Israelites were defeated and every man fled to his tent. The slaughter was very great. Israel lost 30,000 foot soldiers. The Ark of God was captured, and Eli's two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, died. After the Philistines had captured the Ark of God, they took it from Ebenezer to Ashdod. Then they carried the Ark into Dagon's temple and set it before Dagon. When the people of Ashdod rose early the next day, there was Dagon fallen on his face on the Lord before the, on the ground before the ark of the Lord. They took Dagon and put him back in his place. But the following morning when they rose, there was Dagon falling, fallen on his face on the ground before the ark of the Lord. His head and hands had been broken off and were lying on the threshold. Only his body remained. That is why to this day neither the priests of Dagon nor any others who enter Dagon's temple at Ashdod step on the threshold. The Lord's hand was heavy on the people of Ashdod and its vicinity. He brought devastation on them and afflicted them with tumours. When the people of Ashdod saw what was happening, they said, The ark of the God of Israel must not stay here with us because his hand is heavy on us and on Dagon our God. 
So they called together all the rulers of the Philistines and asked them, what shall we do with the ark of the God of Israel? This is the word of the Lord. So quite a, um, quite a long reading this morning because we're looking at uh, 1 Samuel chapters 4 to 7. Now, I wonder if there's anyone here who would describe themselves as a control freak. What a, what a way to start a sermon. Uh, if, if you think you might be, but the, you're not sure, there's a few uh, tests that you can do, a few uh, simple questions uh, that you can ask. Uh, number one, are you a nervous passenger? Uh, if you are, either you regularly travel with someone who's not a very good driver, <laughs> and, uh, and I must say Tissa is a nervous passenger, and it is because I'm not a very good driver. Um, but the other option, well, I'll, I'll let you decide. Uh, the next one, uh, can you bear to see the dishwasher packed differently to the way that you do it? Now, if you're a control freak, you might even be confused by this question. You're thinking, surely there's only one way to pack a dishwasher. <laughs> or when you're sat with someone searching for a film on Netflix, do you have to have the remote? Do you refuse to relinquish it? Now, I can see a few people getting digs in the ribs. So I should just say, I'm only joking. These are, uh, th these are not definitive tests. Uh, just fairly reliable indicators. <laughs> um, but I do think that all of us have a tendency to try to control things that A, we can't control, and B, we're not supposed to control. To the point where sometimes we even try to control God. In today's passage, um, the Israelites try to control God, and as you've heard, uh, it didn't go well for them. So it began with Israel going into this crucial battle against the Philistines, which they lost badly. Um, 4,000 Israelite soldiers died. And the elders got together and they said, why did God allow this to happen? He's supposed to be with us. He's supposed to be fighting for us. What's going on? Now, if you've read the book of Judges that precedes 1 Samuel, or the first three chapters of Samuel, uh, you will know exactly why things were not going well for Israel. Israel had rebelled against God, actually, in all kinds of ways, but the main thing is that they had turned to other gods. They were worshipping the gods of the pagan nations around them, uh, bowing down to idols of wood and stone, and the nation's leaders had become horribly corrupt. It's not that God doesn't care for his people. He wants to protect them. He wants to give them victory in battle. But they have walked out from under his umbrella of protection, so to speak. It's like a parent who wants to care for and protect their child. But if their child runs away from home and lives in a squat or on the streets, they have uh, rejected the person or the people who were protecting them. Uh, they put themselves in danger. Things are not going to go well from that point. But of course, uh, all loving parents will welcome their children back again, like the father in the parable of the prodigal son. If we completely reject and rebel against God, then it's as if we have walked out from under his umbrella of protection. I rebelled against God for many years and kept making a complete mess of my life, and uh, that's what's happening to Israel at this point. But notice they don't stop to look at their relationship with God. There's no acknowledgement of their sin and wrongdoing. Instead, they say, let's get the Ark of the Covenant. The, the word Ark actually means box, and the Ark of the Covenant is basically a, a big fancy box that contained the Ten Commandments. So they say, let's get the Ark and bring it to the front line, because that will make us really powerful. If we've got that in our possession, God will have to fight for us. We'll be invincible. Wrong answer. That's just superstition. It's like hanging a cross from the um, rearview mirror in our car 
and expecting it to stop us having a crash, even though we drive like Lewis Hamilton or Sterling Moss. Religious superstition is just a very crude way of trying to control the situation, trying to control God even. Anyway, the Ark of the Covenant is taken from the tabernacle, that's that big tent in Shiloh, and it's brought to the front line, and it's accompanied by Hophni and Phinehas, those two corrupt priests that we heard about last week. Uh, You remember that Eli was the spiritual leader of Israel, and his two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, were in it for everything they could get. They took the choice cuts of meat from the animals that were to be sacrificed. They slept with the women who served at the entrance to the tent of meeting. They were brazenly unscrupulous. And Eli, uh, their father, neglected to take any action against them. And this was the state of the nation's leadership. So the ark arrives with these two vile characters, Hophni and Phinehas, acting like they're big shots. And the whole camp erupts in this great roar of triumph. It it, it was as if the ground shook beneath them. And there's great irony in this because the ark, as I said, contained the Ten Commandments, the foundation of God's law, the very law that Israel had despised, rejected, and ignored. If only they were as excited about God's law as they were about the physical presence of the ark. And for us, if only we focused on our relationship with God and what God wants from us, instead of focusing all the time on what we want God to do for us, we'd find life so much more fulfilling. Anyway, the ark arrives, a thunderous shout goes up, and the Philistines think that a god has entered the Israelite camp. And um, that's probably how many of the Israelites viewed it as if you can carry God around and use him as a weapon of war. You can see that it's all about control, can't you? The Israelites were trying to control God. Let's get God up to the front line. But the result of all this was that one army, the Israelites, became complacent, and the other army, the Philistines, were scared out of their wits, and they fought with utter desperation. And in the end... 30,000 Israelite soldiers were wiped out, along with Hophni and Phinehas. And their demise was foretold in chapter 3 that we looked at last week when God appeared, not appeared, but um, spoke to Samuel when he was just uh, 12 years old. Uh, You'll notice that Samuel isn't mentioned in this part of the narrative, and I think mainly it's to disassociate him from the decision to use the Ark of God as a weapon. That idea certainly didn't come from Samuel, nor did it have his approval. So Israel suffers this huge defeat. Hophni and Phinehas are killed. And worst of all, the Ark of the Covenant is captured by the Philistines. And there's a soldier from the tribe of Benjamin who runs to Shiloh. You remember, that's where the tabernacle is. That's where they took the Ark from. He he runs there to break this devastating news that the Ark has been captured. And when he does, the whole town lets out this terrible cry, this scream of anguish. It's the exact opposite of the shout of triumph that was heard when the Ark entered the camp. And I think uh, that contrast is there deliberately. Now, uh, Eli, by this time, is an old man, he's half blind, and he's sitting by the roadside waiting to hear news. And he hears this terrible cry and wants to know what's happened. So the soldier, the messenger, tells him, Israel has been defeated, your sons are dead, the Ark of the Lord has been captured. Whereupon Eli falls off his chair, breaks his neck, and dies. And just an aside, but in verse 18, it mentions that Eli was heavy. uh, And that's part of the reason why his neck broke. And I wonder, had he been enjoying the choice cuts of meat along with his corrupt sons? Uh, Tragically, the shock of all this sent Eli's daughter-in-law, Phinehas, his wife, into premature labor. And she died shortly after the birth, which was obviously a much more common occurrence in those days. But before she died, she named her son Ichabod, which literally means no glory. And she said, the Lord has departed from Israel. The thing is, if we reject God, if we say, no, I don't want you, 
he will leave us alone. He will respect our free will to the point where he, he, he allows us to genuinely say no to him. God won't force his way into our lives. If we say, God, I don't want you, we reject him, we turn elsewhere, he will leave us to it. But the point is, Israel was trying to control God and it ended in tragedy. God, God is not Israel's trophy. And just as God opposes pride among the Philistines, so too he opposes pride among his own people. If Israel want to experience God's covenant blessing, they must remain humble and obedient. Instead, they thought they could parade God around and force him to do what they wanted, even though they were completely rebelling against God. Let me give you an illustration. Imagine two friends, let's say they're young men, and one is uh, quite sort of skinny and scrawny and couldn't fight his way out of a wet paper bag. And the other one stands at two metres tall, he's 120 kilos, he's an undisputed mixed martial arts heavyweight champion. And the two of them, they go into a bar. Sounds like it's going to be a joke, it's not going to be a joke. And the scrawny one starts strutting about, acting tough, running his mouth off and picking fights. And he thinks he's invincible because he's got his mate, this MMA fighter, with him. But he doesn't care about his mate, doesn't care how he might feel pretty much ignores him, doesn't even talk to him. But he likes having him there because it makes him feel strong. How long do you think it will be before that man, the professional fighter, is going to allow his friend to... Or, sorry, how long do you think that man, the professional fighter, is going to allow his friend to use, uh, to use him as fuel for his pride, arrogance and stupidity? After a while, he's going to walk out of the bar and leave his friend to it, by which time his friend will probably be so wrapped up in himself that he hasn't realised that the source of his overinflated confidence has left the premises and he gets himself into a whole world of trouble. Of course, all analogies break down. I'm certainly not comparing God to an MMA fighter. I'm just talking about two friends. But when we think that Israel treated God in that same way, I think we can see why God wouldn't stand for it. So Israel were defeated, and the ark was captured by the Philistines. And if Israel treated the ark superstitiously, the Philistines treated it disrespectfully. The ark was taken to Dagon's temple in Ashdod and placed beside Dagon. Uh, Dagon was a, a Philistine god literally carved out of stone. Now, the ark of the covenant wasn't God, nor could it be weaponized. But it was holy, and it did belong with God's people, so God was not going to allow it to remain in enemy hands. In the Old Testament, we get a frequent comparison between the man-made gods of the pagans and the one true God of Israel. Human beings like man-made gods because they can make them in their own image. Uh, the Bible tells us that we are made in God's image, but man likes to make gods in his own image. And it's interesting, man-made gods will only ever ask you to do, or ask its followers to do, the things that they want to do. And it won't ask them to do things that they don't want to do. You see, a man-made god can be controlled, can be moulded to, to what we want from a god, or what we think we want. Now, few people in our society literally bow down to graven images of wood and stone, um, but people do bow down to other gods. We have been created to worship, and if we don't worship God, we just end up worshipping something else. Did you know that every human being is a worshipper of some sort? In our culture, we worship money, sex, lifestyle, career, loved ones. You, you, you hear it said, he worshipped the ground she walked on. Uh, it's good to love and value those who are close to us, but they can't replace God. But most of all, our culture worships self. We turn ourselves into little gods, and we expect the whole world to revolve around us. But none of those things are worthy of our worship, 
and neither was Dagon. He was just a lifeless block of stone. And that first night that the ark was in Dagon's temple, Dagon toppled over onto his face. And in the morning they came and they found him like that and they had to put him back up again. It's crazy, isn't it? They're worshipping a God that can't even stand itself up. And I suppose they, they were hoping it was a coincidence. But then the second night, Dagon toppled forward again and this time his hands and his head break off. Now, in the ancient world, they believed that different gods had jurisdiction in different places. But the message to the Philistines was clear. The God of Israel is king, far above every other so-called God. His sovereignty extends into every kingdom and nation. His power is absolute, even in Dagon's temple. Not only was Dagon toppled and smashed, but there was an outbreak of, uh, our translation said, tumours or boils. And the uh, Greek translation of the Old Testament, the Septuagint, uh, indicates that these boils may have been in the nether regions, so particularly unpleasant. It's not hard to imagine why the people of Ashdod wanted to get shot of this thing, the ark. Uh, so they moved the ark to Gath, and the same thing happened there. So then they moved it again to Ekron, and again, the same thing. This ark is getting moved from city to city like a hot potato. Nobody wants it. And after seven months, the Philistine leaders decide that they've got to get rid of this thing. Now, you might say, well, why did it take them so long to reach that point? I mean, if that was me and that was happening, I'd want to get rid of it a lot, lot sooner than that. Well, to return the ark would be to acknowledge the power of Israel's God. That will be seen as a sign of weakness and encouragement to the Israelite army to attack. That's the way the Philistines were seeing it. And when you're suffering with painful boils in the nether regions, uh, the last thing you want is for anyone to attack you. Um, but I wonder, do we ever stubbornly resist God's power because we fear what might come next? Do we set our course and we rigidly stay with it, regardless of all the different things that God is saying to us along the way? I think we all do that sometimes, don't we? We can be very stubborn. But the Philistines' problem was this, how to return the ark without inciting the Israelite army to attack. And they came up with a cunning plan. So they decided to get two cows that had never been yoked, had never been worked, and they hitched up a cart to the cows and they put on the cart the Ark of the Covenant along with an offering of gold and the gold uh, rather bizarrely was uh, was shaped in the form of rats which I assume accompanied this plague but it doesn't say it rats and actually the boils themselves they shaped the gold into the, the kind of models of the boils uh, pretty weird uh, and they put it all on the uh, cart and the idea was that they, they set the cart off, and if the cart went straight into Israelite territory, uh, then the plague really is from the Lord. But if those cows that were towing the cart turned around and went back to where their calves had been penned up, which would actually be the natural thing for them to do, well then it was all just a nasty coincidence and a false alarm. So that was their kind of final test. Is this really from God? Well, needless to say, the cart went straight back into Israelite territory and it uh, ended up in a place called Beth Shemesh. Uh, but the people of Beth Shemesh still treated the ark like a trophy. They said, yeah, we got the ark back. Now we're invincible again. What can possibly go wrong? And a big crowd of them gathered around the ark and they're all looking inside it and meddling with it. They knew they weren't supposed to do that. There are such strict warnings about that for God's people in the Old Testament. And as a result, 70 of them died because they'd looked into this, this ark. So then the ark gets moved to kiriath Jerim, And it's like, we've got this really powerful thing, but we don't know how to control it. And it's like, well, firstly, it's not the ark itself that's powerful. And secondly, what you're trying to do is control God, to parade him around, to use him as a weapon of war. But finally, in the end of this narrative, Israel gets it. In chapter 7, verse 2, it says, Then all the people of Israel turn back to the Lord. At this point, Samuel 
re-enters the narrative. They, they throw out all the foreign gods, their idols, their Asherah poles, their, the, 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 the things they use for Baal worship, every, all of it went. Uh, they commit to following the one true God of Israel only. Uh, there's fasting, there's confession, and there's genuine repentance. And after that, when the Philistines attack, they're routed, not by the Israelites, but by God himself. There's this tremendous noise of thunder, and the, like the ground shaking. It sends the Philistines into sheer panic. They break ranks and they flee, and the Israelites pursue them. And there's a very simple message here. Israel were rebelling against God, and things were not going well for them. Israel were rebelling against God, and things were not going well for them. We're not surprised by that, are we? That doesn't mean that if we're struggling in life, it's because we're rebelling against God. Godly people still experience trials and difficulties and struggles and pain and tragedy. But if we're not seeking the Lord, if we're not cultivating our relationship with God through Jesus Christ, if our faith is more like religious superstition, if we want the gifts but not the giver, if it's all about what Jesus can do for us, but we don't really want to draw close to Jesus, if that's the extent of our faith, we can't really expect very much, can we? Not because God's, God doesn't want to bless us, but because we're not allowing God to bless us. Think again of the parable of the prodigal son. I'm going to read it in a, in a moment as well. Uh, when the son left his father's house, when he broke relationship with his father, at first he was having a good time, or he thought it was, but things go downhill fairly fast. Everything unravels, and he ends up in poverty, longing to eat the food that he's feeding to the pigs. It was only when he returned to his father's house that his father was able to love him and care for him and protect him and bless him. And this narrative about Israel that we're reading today is almost like the parable of the prodigal son on a national level. Israel were completely rebelling against God to all intents and purposes. They didn't want anything to do with God. They'd rather worship Baal. And things were not going well. And they were wondering why. But Israel got to the point where instead of trying to control God and use him, they mourned their sinful behaviour and they repented of it. They returned to the Father. And for us today, let's continue to reevaluate our relationship with God. God is not at our disposal to be controlled. Our question shouldn't be, why isn't God changing my situation? Rather, our question should be, Lord, how do you want me to change? Lord, how do you want me to change? Christ is there for us. We need to repent of our old sinful behaviour and turn towards him with our whole hearts, remembering <clears throat> that God is in control and not us. We can't use God as a kind of religious superstition. It's a relationship. We love God. We love Jesus Christ. And we have a close relationship with Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we acknowledge that, that very often we kind of want to wheel you out take you out the cupboard, take you out the box and get you to do what we want but without actually spending any time investing in, our, in the relationship that we have with you, without trying to hear from you, without uh, trying to discern what it is that you're saying to us, how you want us to change, how you want us to live. Father, we repent of the times when we've used prayer like a magic lamp that we rub to get the genie and get the answer we want. Father, we pray that we will recognise the need to genuinely repent of our sin, of all that we know to be wrong, to turn to you, and to keep turning to you on a daily basis, putting you first, and longing to have a close relationship with you, and striving for that, knowing that, that your word promises us, when we draw close to you, you draw close to us. So we pray, Lord, this morning, we will draw close to you, and experience the wonderful fulfilment of having you draw close to us. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.
So Israel rebelled against God and things were going badly. And it's only when they returned to God uh, that things happened to change. Um, and I want to read part of the parable of the prodigal son. And the important thing in all this, because sometimes we read the Old Testament and, you know, the, the four chapters of Samuel we've just been looking at are pretty heavy. If you read them all yourselves, it's a lot to take in. But we need to read this through the lens of Jesus. And we need to, to, to come back to what is God's heart. So as I read this, I want you to uh, take note of the father's response and the father's reaction to his son. So this is... Um, Luke 15, 11 to 24. Jesus continued, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. That's effectively telling his father that he wanted him dead because you'd only get that when your father died. So he's basically saying, Father, I want you dead. I want your money. He said, give me your share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger uh, son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country, who sent him to, to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare, and here I am starving to death? I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring, bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. And there we see the heart of our Father in heaven. We see the heart of Jesus, who longs for us to return to him, who longs for us to step back under his umbrella of protection. That doesn't mean that our lives will go swimmingly, there'll never be any problems. But certainly I think we can create a lot of problems in our lives as well. Almighty God and merciful Father, we give you hearty thanks for all your goodness and loving kindness to us and to all people. We bless you for our creation and preservation and all the blessings of this life but above all for your immeasurable love in the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of grace and for the hope of glory. We pray that you will give us hearts that are truly thankful and that we may praise you not only with our lips, but in our lives as we continually renew our relationship with you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. As we celebrate mothers and those with mothering roles in our lives and communities today, Lord, we acknowledge and give thanks for the love of mothers, grandmothers, aunts and other key women in our lives, for their care and concern, for the joy they share with us and also the pain they bear for us. We thank you, Lord, for all they give us and pray for your blessing upon them. We pray for those who do not have a mother figure in their lives today, also for those without children, especially if they find this a burden. We also pray for mothers who have lost children today. We lift them up to you, Lord, and pray that they will know the comfort of your presence. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father, we pray that you will lead the nations of the world in the ways of righteousness and peace and guide their rulers in wisdom and justice for the tranquility and good of all. 
We especially pray that you will grant wisdom to all who exercise authority in the many nations of the world as they handle the COVID-19 pandemic and vaccine rollouts. We pray especially for the leaders and people of India at this time, for health workers and all who are ill or grieving. We also pray for an end to civil unrest in Colombia, that the authorities there may regain peace and control and for the safety of people and security of critical supply lines. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the church throughout the world. Give grace, Heavenly Father, to all bishops and other ministers, especially Philip, our Archbishop, Bishop Jonathan and Reverend Charlie, that by their life and doctrine, they may set forth your true life-giving word and rightly and duly administer your holy sacraments. We pray for the various ministries of St Andrew Springfield and other churches. We pray also for our church leaders, for wisdom, health and renewed strength, and for this congregation that we may receive your word with meek hearts and due reverence and serve you in holiness and righteousness all the days of our lives. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We ask you of your goodness, Lord, to comfort and sustain all who in this transitory life are in trouble, sorrow, need, sickness, or any other adversity. Father, we especially lift up before you Emma, Louise, Penny, Robert, Lee, Lyndall and their family, and our young people as they make their way in an ever more complex world. We also bless your holy name for all your servants who have died in the faith of Christ. Give us grace to follow their good examples, that with them we may be partakers of our heavenly kingdom. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Almighty God, you have promised to hear our prayers. Grant that what we have asked in faith, we may by your grace receive. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Uh, let us all repeat our Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. <laughs> 